Welcome everybody to this episode of the Tabletop Battlefield Live. I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. And tonight we're continuing our series here of Painting Cypher, Lord of the Fallen from Games Workshops. Warhammer 40,000 tabletop miniatures game. So tonight I am going to be working on his face a little bit more. And then i got to clean up some of the mistakes with his little guard below his face from me screwing up his face. Get the hood in there a little bit. So do that from time to time. It's requiring a lot of thin coats of paint. So it'll be kind of a little bit of that. Jump something else. But go back and, oops, sorry, and so on. But other than that, I think I'm going to start working on the back details then. So he's got his backpack, the little Space Marine power pack that he always carry, and the massive sword he's carrying, along with the other half of the massive sword, which is attached to the miniature via the bottom of his cloak. So those are the two things I'm going to start working on now, because you can see they kind of go together like that, as so. But I will be working on that, like I said, when the face is drying. But in addition to all that, I've got some other fun stuff over here to talk about. More about this as it goes on. <laughs> Random little picture I just held up there. Um, as I mentioned before on these live streams, also one thing before I get to that, I have a new camera angle. And of course Cypher's not in the middle of the camera. There we go. So I've, I've got a much closer up top down camera. I think it's a, oh yeah, it looks a lot nicer, I bet. There, you can see what I'm doing a little bit easier. And it's pretty close in terms of like, the new camera angle very close to what I'm looking at, so it should be pretty easy to kind of see what's going on. I'm, I'm not 100% 100 sure I'm sold on the whole auto-focusing at the camera, and trying to see if it's, but, how it's, but it's like focusing on my hand, isn't it? Um, well, let's we'll see what I can do here. I'll do the best I can, right? <laughs> all right, well, anyway, enough of that. I'll be playing around with that some more to get that all sorted out. But my topic for tonight that I'm going to be talking about, just kind of for fun, is I have mentioned before in some of these live streams that I have been doing some research into Michigan's history. Uh, I live in the state of Michigan, in case you're wondering why I picked that in particular. And I was talking, I think, before a long time ago about the first like, research I was looking into was about a act of arson in the city of downtown Rochester. It burned down a paper mill in 1875, and I'm kind of finishing that whole story up right now in terms of video editing. I actually shot a bunch of video. It didn't really turn out very good. Media resource decoding error. Hmm. Look at my stream right now. This is media. This is on my la my laptop where I watch my stream. Media resource decoding error. I don't know what that means. Uh, let me refresh my. Twitch stream over here, make sure I'm still live. I might have to start and stop this thing again. Do 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 do. It says offline. Hmm. Nope, wait, maybe online. No, hold on. We're gonna have to start and stop this again, I think. I have never seen that error before. Stop streaming. No, oh, damn it! It's working now. <clears throat> Note to self, cut this part out for the Tabletop Battlefield and YouTube episodes. All right. I think we're up and running again. I don't know. I really have no idea what happened there. Let me check my audio. Yay for live internet TV. Let me turn down my music. All right, let's see here. The wonderful problems I'm having. Okay. That's better. All right, everything's finally working. My computer decided to freak out there or something went wrong, yay. All right, so anyway, back to working on Cypher here. I'm working on his face at the moment. I'm just applying several very thin layers of Kiev, or I'm sorry, that's that's a, that's a city Ukraine. Um, Kezlev, Kezlev Flesh, it's kind of the Caucasian flesh color in Games Workshop Citadel paint line. Now, what I was talking about just a moment ago, was that, you know, I've been doing some research in the history of Michigan. 
And, like, the first episode was going to be about, like, an act of arson that occurred in 1875 that burned down a paper mill in downtown Rochester. I'm getting pretty close to wrapping that particular episode up. Um, I got have I got to reshoot some video. I kind of just sucked at shooting at some on-site video the first time of me talking. So I need to go back and fix that. So I got to go back out on site. And the problem I had was, well, it's just me um, filming stuff. So it's myself, my tripod, and good thing cops don't seem to give a crap what I'm doing. A police officer came by several times and never said anything to me. <laughs> but um, it's t it was bright and sunny and it's very difficult to frame the shot when it's just you with a tripod and you're standing you know 10 feet away from said tripod so what i'm going to actually do it never it didn't occur to me at the time is that i've got a elgato 60s or something like that i forget what it is it's that's that's what I, right now is hooking up my video gear to my computer it's an hdmi to usb 3.0 converter so I can, I can actually take the output from my camera, run through this thing, and plug it into my little Surface Pro, and I can get a monitor from my camera where I'm standing, so I can kind of do my little focus, what I think it would be, walk over, check it, blah, blah, blah. That's just some random video stuff. I don't know why I'm talking about that. I got off on it. But, okay. <laughs> but, all I'm said, that first episode about the arson in 1875 is just about done, other than that, about five minutes of video I got to reshoot. But the next one is going to be about, it's going to be part of like an eventual series, Michigan and the American Civil War. In particular, I'm going to kind of take a look at a monument, as the photo I showed off a minute ago, that's in Birmingham, Michigan. But more on that in just a bit, because I'm going to let this first, this next layer of paint that I dry, let me, you know what I can do? Because if I move this thing around, I, I really want to focus on it. So Jason's going to do some camera adjustments. This 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 is my the camera I'm working on right now is an HF two hundred. Let's see here. It is old school. I've, this is actually something I've had um, since oh my goodness, Tabletop Battlefield season three. So we, this camera here is about eight years old. Um, <laughs> one second, I gotta find my. I wanna. <clears throat> No, that's not what I want. That's not what I want either. Oh, that just turns the camera light on. That same button I just pressed a moment ago. <laughs> There's a way I can turn on... Oh, well, whatever. I'll have to deal with it. Um, what I'm trying to do is turn on the manual manual focus. I know it's in here somewhere. Exposure, BLC. What is BLC? I have no freaking clue. Uh, that's all that stuff. That's just that some more. That's that some more. Here's this for, how's this for exciting? Oh, no, that's not what I want. <laughs> Thanks, camera. Whatever. I will fiddle with it later. Um, so just kind of deal with maybe the focus kind of be a little wonky right now. So anyway, I'm going to work on the back of Cypher here. Well, the first layer of the Keylev Keslev flesh is drying. I'm just going to start applying some Dawnstone Gray to the back of the various locations here on his on his back, like the little power pack attachment point, and what's going to become the sword scabbard. So the monument in question I'm talking about, uh, you know, I discovered it is one of the many spots, like most of these things that I'm going to be on this little series I'm doing. Go back to uh, their ingress portals. That's kind of where I stumble across these things at. This one is a monument to the soldiers who served in the American Civil War who are from Oakland County. And in particular, and well not in particular, and specifically it's, it's for the soldiers who were killed during the Civil War, who actually will die during the Civil War. As, you'll, as you kind of dig in 
to this thing a little bit. You, if you ever look into the details of Civil War casualties in terms of the American Civil War, um, the vast majority of the soldiers who died in the war weren't actually killed in battle. They died from disease. Uh, some of those being disease being the result of being wounded in battle. Because, you know, if you basically got wounded in battle, you, you, it, it was probably a death sentence in many cases. You, you do find records of Civil War soldiers who were discharged for disability. That's the terminology they used in the, in the records. And those are the ones who got wounded but managed to survive the injury. But this particular monument, so you know, was was, bi was built to honor the soldiers from four communities. So not just sorry, not just Oakland County, not the not entire Oakland County. Um, the soldiers from Bloomfield, Royal Oak, Michigan, Bloomfield, Michigan, Royal Oak, Michigan, Troy, Michigan, and crap. <laughs> What's number four? Give me a moment here. I have this written down. I swear, I've looked at this thing a few times. Uh, Southfield. Southfield is the fourth. Southfield, Michigan is the fourth city on the monument. It's a white spire. I believe it's made of marble. I'm not entirely. Sh I don't know. I shouldn't say that. Actually, not entirely sure what it's made of. It's probably written down over here. But in each side, you have the names of the soldiers from that particular town who died in the American Civil War, and then it identifies whether they were killed in action or died from some other related source primarily disease but it could be really anything um and what i wanted to do was just have for fun kind of dive in and track down some of these combat records of these soldiers and i kind of want to see you know ask the question okay how do we know these soldiers died in the american civil war and i'm you know the disclaimer being that I'm not asking that question because I'm not intending to challenge, you know, the authenticity of these names, but more as it being an intellectual exercise to kind of learn about what Civil War soldiers faced and and things like that. So that's what it's tending to be more of that kind of historical exercise. And it's surprisingly difficult. I don't know if I, I don't know why I say surprisingly difficult. The only thing I can think of why you know it may seem surprisingly difficult. I, I kind of knew this going into it. I, I've done just general research in the American Civil War before. I got a fantastic book over here. If you want to read a good book on the American Civil War, I got one called Battle Cry. Oh, it's, give me a moment. Is that is that the right name of it? It's got a long name to it. It is Battle Cry of Freedom, the Civil War Era, by McPherson, part of like the Oxford American History series or something like that. There's apparently an entire series of books, you know, each one covering 25 years ish of American history. And this this book begins 1840 and goes through the end of the American Civil War and begins with what's going to be called the Re Reconstruction Era. So I kind of, you know, I got some general idea as to, you know, what I was getting into. And it shouldn't be surprising that it's so hard to figure out the records of these soldiers just because there weren't really good records back then, like there kind of are today for our military and soldiers and things like that. But I'll, just to give you an idea of what you're dealing with, media resource decoding error again. Let me hit refresh. And I'm not gonna, I don't know what the heck is going on. Um, so anyway, I, I put a little bit of gray paint there. This is, I've been half distracted trying to debug stuff. So I'm gonna go back and put another layer of flesh on Cypher's face. It seems, it still seems to be streaming. It's just, I don't know if my computer's freaking out. But anyway, so I'm putting another layer of the Keslev flesh on Cypher's face here. Eventually, you should get enough uh, layers on it to where it's pretty much opaque. And the reason why I'm putting lots of little layers on it is that with, p with human faces on these Games Workshop miniatures, or any miniature really in general, it's very easy to put mu too much paint in one area and just kill all the detail, whether you basically get rid of an eye socket or cover over a lip or who knows what. It's very, very easy to do that. 
So that's why I'm working with incredibly thin down paint. And that's why I'm probably gonna put five or six layers of this thin down paint. So I can get the same proper amount of base color, but I hopefully won't lose any detail. Granted, he's, his face is so shrouded in this hood here that if you lost a little bit of detail, you're, it's probably not gonna matter that much, but you know. It's good practice for when you actually have a guy whose face is quite visible. But anyway, um, so the, we can talk about the situation that I've got is I found several sources of Michigan servicemen in the American Civil War. The problem is I don't know, I don't have any really truly original sources. So I've got a, a nice catalog from 1900. Of course, American Civil War ended in 1865. There's a catalog from 35 years later. I have one from 1877, a limited one, because I think the 1900 one was put together by the state of Michigan because the credit goes to like the archives of Michigan or something like that. It's in the public domain. I'm pretty sure it's a government document. So, so someone did that research. Um, the 1877 one is from a book called History of Oakland County of 1877. Sorry, History of Oakland County with illustrations from 1877. This is a really good book in terms of just basic historical information about Oakland County as in 1877. Oakland County being uh, the county that's just north of Detroit. So Detroit, Michigan is in Wayne County. And you go one county north, so the, the northern border of Detroit, Michigan, you go into Oakland County. And that's what this, this book was about. It was put together probably by this, the Oakland County to celebrate approximately 50 years of existence. Oakland County, I believe, was founded in 1821. But, so what you've got here is a list of all the soldiers who served in Oakland County and what happened to them. But once again, this is 1877, we're 12 years past the American Civil War. So this is also not an original record. It was compiled from somewhere. I don't know where, but you know, it came from somewhere. <laughs> and then you've got this monument. This monument, as far as I can tell, was built in 1869. So we're now at four years post-American Civil War. And let me show you that photograph I have. This, this particular photograph, I got it from a book on Birmingham history. So this is actually from a book in the Birmingham Library. But this photo here is dated to like 1891. Uh, placed here, this very first, when it was the original location, intersection, a second. So it's somewhere, this, this photograph is somewhere taken somewhere between 1869 and 1891, because the, in 1891, this monument was moved from the location in the photograph here. So we don't know what year that photograph was from, but that one there, for those of you who are familiar with Birmingham, Michigan, it would be where Old Woodward and Maple and Maple meet today. So I don't know. It's probably highly unlikely that anybody ever listens to this has been in Birmingham, Michigan. But that's where that photo would be if you know if that was today. Um, so that monument right there, as it currently stands, is the oldest record I have of casual, basically, of service records from American Civil War. The national park system, this is where things get weird and why I'm pretty confident the U.S. military doesn't have a whole lot of information on the American Civil War, or if they do, I don't know how to get access to it, because I think you might, have to, you might have to get into the National Archives, but I'll talk more about that. I'm rambling again, because, man, this history stuff is a lot of fun, but you, but you just jump around trying to look up different things. It is like a crazy freaking treasure hunt, I describe it. But the National Park Service... Now, the National Park Service in the United States gets involved in the American Civil War because, American Civil War history, because many of the battlefields uh, for the American Civil War, especially the famous ones, well, the famous ones anyway, have been turned into national parks. 
and the National Park Service has a very comprehensive record of service of at least enlistment records. So we've basically got names, ranks, and the units in which the men op fought for, fought in. So like the 23rd Regiment of Michigan, or in particular, here in the Oakland County area, the 22nd Regiment of Michigan was the big one. That was where most of the men from this area uh, were enlisted. Because like in, in an Oakland County of 1877 book, there would be like, you know, 20, 30 names for a Michigan regiment. They needed the 22nd Infantry Regiment of Michigan, and it's like two pages. <laughs> so, and that's not surprising. Oftentimes, the regiments in the American Civil War had something in common, whether it was geographic location, it may be cultural, it may be, you know, they, were, they had some kind of like common ancestry, where they're from some, you know, common European country. There, there's something, there's something about them. As to, so it's not surprising that you'd see something like the 22nd Regiment of Michigan have a whole bunch of people from Oakland County. Okay, let me let me move this the main miniature aside for right now, and let's dive into this the actual backpack and sword piece. So the thing about the National Park Service information, though, this is Don Stone Gray that I'm working with initially, is that it does not have a complete service record of the soldiers. Like I said, it's just the enlistment records. So we don't know what happened to them. It doesn't have any information on whether they, you know, were they killed in action, whether they survived the war, whether they got captured. We don't really know. So all I can, all I've been able to do is, so the names that I have on the, the, the monument I start, I take those names, if I even can read the names and confirm where they are, because there are a lot of names on that monument that are are basically like a first name only. It'll be like, um, let's read, you know, like for example, the one that I'm trying, I've been trying to really track down because it's something, something strange in terms of going on with, I don't know, like why this guy, he's basically the records of this one soldier are conflicting. And I'm not entirely sure why, and I may not be able to figure out without some genealogical research. But like, for example, I had, oh no, never mind. I, his name is spelled out. Um, <laughs> I was thinking of J. Simonson. Um, but we'll have things like there's, and there's an E.R. Smith. At least in that case, we have like a middle initial, E being the first name, R being the middle initial, Smith being the last name. So it's very likely I can identify who that one is. I don't think I've looked him up specifically. I've looked up a lot of people from Bloom, Bloomfield. But we have names on here. For example, um, where's the one that I really... J. Kelly. That's all that's on the monument is J. Kelly. There are, I think, eight different J. Kellys that served in Michigan in various regiments in the American Civil War, there'd be a John Kelly, a James Kelly, a there's no Justins back then. I'm pretty sure, um, but you know, I can I can find eight different names in the National Park Service database, which maybe <coughs> sorry about that. So which and then I got to try to cross reference with a different um, different documents. The problem is. The Oakland County, I can search the Oakland County history book for a last name, and maybe I'll find it, and maybe I won't, because <laughs> there's a couple of reasons for that. One, if the author didn't think that particular soldier was from Oakland County, he didn't put it in there. Whoever, I don't know who compiled that list of records for this Oakland County historical book, but they do conflict a little bit with this, uh, this monument. Um... And I'll talk about that a little in a little bit because I did figure find one guy who's, who conflicts a little bit. But when I just have something like a J. Kelly, and I've got eight possible names, maybe I can I can possibly search the Oakland County of History book, and I can get an an ID as to um, which soldier it might be. But you know, if there are two J. Kellys in Oakland County, I. 
I don't know. It's, it's, I don't have the information to find out unless they were both maybe, you know, like, Let's see, what is J. Kelly listed at? On the monument, J. Kelly is listed with a... Where'd he go? He's in Bloomfield. Um, there's like 50 names on this on this particular monument. That's why I'm kind of like... There it is. D. So J. Kelly is listed as D. So he was he died in the Civil War some way other than killed in action. So this could, like I said, be disease. It could have been died in a Confederate prison. There's a lot of different things that it, it could have been. So maybe, you know, if I go ahead and look up J. Kelly in, some, in this Oakland County history book and it happens to have records that match, I might be able to figure out who he is. But if there's two J. Kellys in there, definitely not. But even if there's only one, I have no guarantee that the J. Kelly in Oakland County history book is actually the one that's talked about on this monument because the Oakland County History Book must use some other way of identifying kind of labeling casualties because there's been at least one case going through the names on this, on this monument where the monument they're listed as D as in you know kill they died some way other than combat but in the Oakland County History Book, they're listed as missing in action at a certain battle. In particular, um, the 22nd Regiment of Michigan, they must have been on the front lines on at the Battle of Chickamauga, Chickamauga Creek. So this was, I, where's that? I believe that's in Georgia. I gotta go look that up. I forget exactly. No, the Tennessee. Sorry, Tennessee. Wait. Because it's the Chatt Chattanooga and Chickamauga campaign. Those two are always together. In fact, way back in the days of the tabletop battlefield, I talked briefly about a Civil War game I had called Chick Chickamauga and Chattanooga. Because those two battles occurred right after each other, and they're relatively in close proximity. Obviously, Chattanooga is Tennessee. Chickamauga, it might actually be on the border of Tennessee and Georgia. I don't really know off the top of my head where that that river is. I have to go back and dig that up. Um, but the 22nd Regiment of Michigan was clearly on the front lines in that one. Because when you look at Oakland County history book, it's just killed in action in, at, Ch at, at Chickamauga. Killed in action at Chickamauga. Killed in action at Chickamauga. Missing in action at Chickamauga. It just, it's soldier after soldier is just, they just, they got destroyed. Which generally in line with the American Civil War when a regiment got in the front lines and saw action, huge casualties were almost always the result. It's, it's, oh my goodness. If you've never really studied Civil War battles, it was, it's just horrific. The sheer amount of just death that would occur in those things. Granted it from other sources, like the uh, Warlord Games guys, they make, you know, they make black powder. So they have some historical references for their black powder game. I've got the Glory Hallelujah expansion for black powder, which is the American Civil War. And they have a whole, they have a fantastic commentary on the, on the American Civil War in that particular book. You know, they mentioned that the casualties that were suffered in the American Civil War were on par with the Napoleonic's heiress. But it still doesn't change the fact that all those wars at that time were horrifically brutal. I mean, the short answer, as I'm getting off topic again, but the short answer was they were still using Napo early Napoleonic era technology or ta tactics with getting very advanced rifles that were just deadly accurate for the time. But alas, that'll be that'll be another topic. But. But the point of that whole random tangent I just went off from there was just to, just to mention that this Oakland County history book, um, how there the fates of the soldiers listed in there don't always match what's on this particular monument, which would lead me to suggest that the sources for this monument, the original source of this monument, which are very likely the local townspeople, they're the ones who probably said. They, it, it probably may, may have just been they had a town meetings and the people, you know, who had lost 
their family members in the Civil War stood up and gave the names and, and they said, you know, and they told them what, you know, how the person died based on what they know. And I don't, you know, you really can't be entirely sure if, given how that war played out, if the people actually, you know, had, the family members had the uh, actual information as to what happened to their members in the service. It'd be interesting to, that's, that's so much to look into. I need to make a note about that. How... How reliable did family members back then know about, you know, what really happened to their other family members who were fighting the service? Would they know they got killed in a battle? Would they know if they died by disease? That's an interesting question to look into. Um, I haven't wrote that one down yet. Because one of the things with this whole video series I'm doing, it's not just me lecturing history. It's me taking you on the journey of how I learned this history. You know, when I get this first episode out about the paper mill fire, you'll see that because there's a big question, like, you know, I talk about the whole arson thing because this particular historical marker talks all about arson, but the mention of arson is, n is not in any of the newspapers. So any of the newspaper articles from the time about this fire don't talk about arson. This Oakland County History book doesn't talk about arson. So it's, I'm trying to take you along this exploration exploration I did to try to answer that question and you know you see halfway through the episode that I'm not entirely convinced that this thing actually was an arson case and you have to see how it all ends um, when I do release the episode but I you know because that's the way this exploration of history really is it's not history is not just here's what happened and people tell you what happens because frankly <laughs> there's a lot of messiness to history it's not obvious as much as you know we like to think that we've got history all figured out <laughs> there's a lot of fuzziness to history because frankly at this point many original sources don't exist and the closest thing we have to a lot of original sources could be 10 20 30 years after the events happen, especially when you get back into the old, the really ancient days, you know, um, I was listening to Dan Carlin. He's, he produces a show called Hardcore History. Fantastic, fantastic series. If you enjoy really in-depth, interesting history. Um, you really got to enjoy history, though, to be honest with you. But, you know, there's... He did a whole episode, or whole episode, four-hour discussion about the conquest of the Gauls by Caesar, Julius Caesar, and his conquest of the Gauls. And he points out this whole this whole narrative that we accept as actual history is written by Julius Caesar himself. We have no other sources than you know the guy who went in there and said he killed a bunch of people. And granted, he probably did, but you can also because of that you can also assume that aspects of this history are really more propaganda because there's some points where he he gives credit to like one of his buddy's sons as the one who saved the battle so you can kind of start seeing that you know how much of this narrative history is really propaganda of julius caesar trying to make himself look awesome and you know we don't really know the answer to that question but that's another rant that's a there's give me off some random tangents <laughs> okay Here's what I'm gonna to try to do. We need to make his face look just a tiny bit more properly colored per se. What you'll find is your basic flesh color is really not the proper color of skin. Just look, you can look at my hand here on the video. You can clearly see that there are um, red tones underneath my skin and they're very obvious to see. So we really want to try and add a little bit of red, just a little bit of red coloring there to him. Now this is very, very challenging. So what I need to do, I got my wet palette in front of me here at the moment on the camera. I am going to use, hmm, let's go with the Mephiston Red. This is Games Workshop's base color. I'm going to put down a little bit of color over there. I'm going to take some of the where is my, here it is. Take some of the Kislev flesh, really water it down over here. And then I'm going to take, this is all this dark red here. This is um, Mephiston red. Take a 
tiny little bit of that on my brush and mix it in. And this is very tricky because it's like the smallest, too much is, can be too much, but we can always fix that later. So now I've got a very bright pink over here. This is still incredibly watered down paint. So I have not, you know, I don't want this to be thick at all. I'm going to take a very small amount of this watered down paint on my brush and very carefully I put a little bit on the face and then I try to, you know, I'm trying to put very small amounts of shade on here, very tiny amounts because you can really quickly screw this up. I don't know where I was going with the whole Civil War stuff anymore. I, I lost train, my train of thought. But... <laughs> train derailed. I should have like a sound effect whenever my train of thought gets derailed. There we go. I like it. You can start to see there's a little bit of a reddish color, reddish hue going on his skin there. And that's what I'm trying to go for. Very, very small amount. And then I'm going to also get some wash over here in just a minute. But but let me talk about that one soldier I mentioned, the star, Jay Simon's son. And this is going to be another example of why it can be very, very tricky to track down the fate of these American Civil War soldiers. And I'm like, I don't really know. So let me go grab my wash that I have over here. And we'll talk about that case in a moment. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. Because here's, here's the problem I ran into with Jay Simon's son. His name is on the monument, is marked as being from Royal Oak. The thing is, um, there is a Jay Simon's son that served in the Michigan. He served in the 23rd Infantry Regiment. So there was a soldier by that name but he was not listed in the History of Oakland County in 1877 book as being part of the 23rd Regiment from Oakland County. He was not listed anywhere in that book other than this list of names. Because let me, so what I'm going by here, I have this thing. This actually came, this particular page came from that book I've mentioned before about the history of Birmingham, Michigan. But this actual text and the sketch and everything here actually comes from Oakland County History of the Illustrations, 1877. So that page that was in like a 1970s-ish, I think, history book comes from a much earlier source. I'm going to have to go back and dig up that, that this Birmingham book and try to figure out, you know, if there's anything else there that's not in the 1877 book. But regardless, um, what it shows is that whoever put together the Oakland County 1877 book it may have been multiple people. In fact, it probably was multiple people. Because I have a similar book, The History of Oakland County, from 1977. And it was assembled by like 60... 60 ooh, 3D printer's done. Um, it was assembled by like 60 different authors or something like that, maybe 100 different authors. So it's entirely possible that uh, there's you know a bunch of authors going on here. Oh, by the way, this is Seraphin Sapia. This is it. Let me hold it without spilling it. There we go. This is GW, one of GW shade colors. And this is just makes some very, does a very good job of bringing out just some of the details on a Keslev flesh, Keslev flesh face. But you need very, very small amounts, very tiny amounts of this. And you just want to get it in the recesses, like in the mouth, under the nose, things like that. Cough button. Okay. So the thing about the J. Simon son, I did find him in the 1900 records. So the 1900 American Civil War records did contain his name as being part of the 23rd Regiment of Michigan. Now, the thing about those records 
is that the Jay Simonson there is listed as being from Port Austin, Michigan. Port Austin, I believe, if I remember my Michigan geography, is in the Thumb region. It's nowhere, it's nowhere near Oakland County, nowhere near Royal Oak, where he's listed as... Uh, you, the point is, he would not be, if he's from Port Austin, he would not be from, you know, the, those four cities that assembled this monument. Unless, unless there's two possibilities we don't know, that there was another J. Simon son, there very easily could have been multiple J. Simon sons, who served in the Michigan, Michigan regiments in the American Civil War, and the guy who I find from the 23rd Regiment was indeed from Port Austin, had nothing to do with the J. Simonson, who is listed on this monument. I believe the J. Simonson in the 23rd Regiment was, uh, did not survive the war. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly what happened to him. I have it, his file saved somewhere. I'll dig it up later. Or, you know, the other possible option is that indeed J. Simonson he may have been born in Oakland County, and he just moved to Port Austin before joining the or draft, probably being drafted or volunteered. One of the two, I don't know. I actually don't know if he was drafted or he volunteered, but before actually entering the service. So it's entirely possible he is the same person, and therefore maybe he was, you know, originally from this area, but because he wasn't living in this area when he was enlisted in the United States Army. That, that's why he did not get included in the Oakland County records and, you know, is, is listed for me in Port Austin in the 1900 records, but it's still on this monument. And the problem is, unless I go into some genealogical research, there isn't any way for me to ever really verify that. I'd have to try to find <clears throat> some reference that a J. Simonson lived around here and moved to Port Austin, and you know what? I'm not going to be able to find that. I mean, there's, you know, there's a small chance that I could find some weird reference. Maybe, I don't think there were yearbooks back in the 1860s. A random fun fact about historical research. Um, libraries keep tons of records, or keep basically tons of local yearbooks. I don't know exactly, I mean, the thing about, you know, that may be why they do it, right? It's effectively a population record of that year, right? So if you grew up in the city, you now have a, have a record that you were there because you were in you know, the, the school yearbooks. So if you ever want to go look at some old high school yearbooks, you can probably do so by going to your local library. And they probably have a local history section where you can find information about um, local yearbooks. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's interesting. In general, the library's local history sections are pretty freaking cool, just if you've never done that. That's where I found that Oakland County 1877 book. I did end up finding a copy of it online also, but I initially found it in that um, in the library. But also, they have an atlas that I, I cannot find online. So they have like an atlas of Oakland County, so I can see it from 1872, I think it is. I believe it's 72. So it's kind of cool to be able to go back and you can see, you know, what cities look like, what the road layouts look like. I can even find, you know, who owned what property. Um, you can try to play the game. Can you find your name on, you know, your name on some property somewhere because someone in 1872 had your name? <laughs> and yes, I've done that. I actually, I think, what did I do? I found, just by... <laughs> Purely by random coincidence, somebody with the same name as my brother actually owned a property in 1872 from about a few miles from where he lives. It's just kind of kind of interesting. Okay, just purely crazy coincidence thing. So I'm taking some more of the Kislev flesh, and I'm going to lighten his face up a little bit more, but I'm going to just do my best. Oops, a little, little too not, not watered down enough. But I'm going to try to avoid getting the paint back in a lot of the recesses. That's going to be kind of tricky to do with the thin down paint. And I'm already screwing it up. But, you know, we can fix it. I 
faces are always a little dicey to work with. I think I might have went a little bit overboard with the wash, maybe. So I'm using the, this has been the artificial layer extra small brush from Games Workshop and now I'm really kind of focusing on the crevices to try to remove the paint that I just put on. So I'm kind of scooping out, I'm kind of sucking up paint with a brush from like where his eye sockets are, where underneath his nose, around his mouth. So the idea being that the light paint I just put on isn't going to get too much into the recesses and I can always fix that by you know doing a little bit more of a balance of work with the wash and go back and forth back and forth blah 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 <laughs> faces are always an absolute pain I'm not gonna lie but doing you know multiple thin layers of wash then brighter bri brighter color than wash it's not a bad thing because any kind of when it comes to skin textures the more variety you can kind of add, more subtle variety, is going to make it look better. It's never a bad thing to have a lot of subtle variety in skin. It just isn't. Um, so I'm taking a little, going back with a little bit of the wash and focusing on some of the recesses again. Just really trying to pull out those details. You know, I'm using tiny amounts of wash. You probably can't even see that only the very tip of that brush there is actually coated in the Serif and Sophia. Cool, I like it. Uh, we'll see how it looks when it dries. That'll kind of give you a really good idea as to, you know, if it's looking pretty good. Let me try this. Take a tiny bit of the white that I have here. I have off-color white. I can mix in a small amount of the Kiev flesh with that. And maybe try a few just very, very light highlights. I'm talking very light highlights. <laughs> a little too bright there, Jason. A little too bright. Let's fix that up a little bit. And kind of spread it around. A and kind of just dry brush a little bit in some of the highlighted areas and well I hose that up good okay so don't try to do that 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 really does not look great um quickly quickly remove paint <laughs> though it doesn't look half bad actually to be honest with you I'm not sure how well you can even see in the camera it's like you can but you know, regardless, the takeaway tonight <laughs> of this painting of Cypher is to understand that trying to figure out casualty records for the American Civil War is incredibly difficult, and that's why <laughs> the when you try to figure out exactly how many people were killed in the American Civil War, soldiers, civilians, alike, you're dealing with a range of like six hundred thousand to a million. <laughs> Because nobody has any freaking clue, unfortunately. And that's, I think, kind of the story that I'm going to try to spin with this episode is really that's kind of the big tragedy in that it's quite possible that the records that these soldiers, you know, died fighting for their country, the only really record of it may be random monuments scattered across the country. They're all over the place. You know, it, obviously the whole Confederate monuments thing has been in the news recently for various reasons but you know and that but you know there's not not just like you know main the main characters of the civil war you've got um cities all across the country 
have monuments that just maybe have some names on them that you know indicate the soldiers who died in the American Civil War. Rochester, Michigan has a really interesting one, a monument that's for, dedicated to a one soldier. And this is definitely a story I'm going to dig into because apparently if you can, this information should be out there, who, who was captured by the Confederates and then was supposed to be executed. But Jefferson Davis, who was the president of the Confederacy, actually pardoned him for some reason. So I mean, that'll be a good story to dive into. But, you know, there aren't really good records of, you know, the soldiers who died in the American Civil War. And then, you know, that's maybe kind of the big tragedy of this whole situation is that we really don't know, never will know, you know, and what is exactly what happened, you know, in terms of who of who died fighting and was the most violent war in the history of, this United, in history of the United States in terms of the number of Americans killed. Obviously, you know, World War II was much worse, but there was m more Americans killed in the American Civil War because, you know, both sides were Americans um, than there were, you know, in any other wars since then. I think that'll work for his face. You get a little, little bit of variation going on there across the skin. You get a little bit of the details being brought out. I might, let me put a tiny bit more wash on there, on that. Just a tiny bit more and see if I can just get a little bit more details in his face brought out. I'm not 100% sure, but we will give it a shot. He can't, t he kind of looks like he's frowning a little bit. I mean, he's cypher, he's probably ticked off, right? There we go. Bring a little bit more detail out of out of his face. But in this particular episode that I was talking about for Michigan history, I don't know. Maybe maybe end of the year. Maybe early next year. It's just kind of a side thing I'm working on. I want to produce a couple of those videos and see how popular they are. I mean, they'd be kind of cool if they if I could get enough popularity to where I can start making more of them and make some money off them. But that's just kind of a long term. Let's see what I can do because there's not really good historical content about Michigan out there, and especially not good stuff that it kind of goes into the history and really tries to figure out why we know what we know, kind of a thing. But anyway, I think about it's about time to call tonight's live stream done, despite having some weird technical glitches over here on my computer. We're making progress on Cypher. We got a face. I need to work on the inside of the hood and the little mask thing right there next time. And then I can finish up, hit this little chain holding his cape on. And I can start working on the sword as well. I think what I'm going to do with the sword, so we've got um, this little, I don't know what you want to even call this part of the scabbard. It's a green cloth. That, that's cloth down there maybe. Maybe it's cloth. I'm not really sure. It might be. I think I'm going to do that dark green, so do a lot of green work here. Because supposedly, when this, this is supposed to be the sword of Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the Dark Angels. That's what. I wouldn't be surprised if... Um, well, that's probably the thing. Cypher's probably trying to bring him back to life. Because, you know, they're bringing all the Primarchs back in 40k. So I wouldn't be surprised if Lionel Johnson is going to be coming back pretty soon. And then the sword continues down here. What looks to be... I'm almost certain those are all skulls. You know, it's, it's Warhammer, so they're probably just skulls. <laughs> so we'll, I'll work down here, painting that up as skulls. And then I don't know, there's a little, there's something at the bottom here. It's like some sort of just decorative metal piece. Um, I might just keep try to make that silver, and that'll look kind of cool. So that's probably what I'll do with the sword. And then the, the top up here, we can do like a gold cross guard, and then the handle and hilt area. That, could, that looks to be just kind of like a, a leather wrap and then some decorative design at the top. Probably just be silver or gold. Probably do silver. That kind of goes well. Probably what I'll do is do silver, the kind of tarnished silver look that I've been doing with the rest of him. Because the sword, if it is Lionel Johnson's sword, is as old as the armor he's wearing. So I'd be kind of give a little bit of a uniform look to that. But that's going to be for next time. Possibly or, you know, later on for painting Cypher here. Let me slide my camera back to my main one. So I want to thank you guys all for watching. Once again, I'm Jason, the creator of the Tabletop Battlefield. I'm going to be 
I'm working on some things with that website. Hopefully, going to be doing something new with it not too far in the future. We will see as things come along. I'm thinking maybe, I'm sorry, maybe later in the year you'll see something new. Maybe early next year. I'm figuring out some of the details right now, but that's why I've been doing a lot of live streaming and I've been putting these episodes out to the Tabletop Battlefield feed. Hey, look, I'm still around and we're still working on the Tabletop Battlefield Christmas special as usual. Usual. I think both Ryan and Kyle are gonna be interested in our main topic right here that I brought up. <laughs> Let me pull this thing around. We are speed building. This monstrosity of a Lego kit. This is the Lego UCS Rebel Snow Speeder. Uh, what does that say? 1703 pieces. I don't know. It'd be kind of fun to see how long it takes to build it. Maybe I'd like to try to do three hours. Like five hours is one person can build it in five hours, according to some people on the internet. Four and a half to five hours, and closer to five, five and a half, really. Three of us can probably get it done in two and a half, three hours. I did a live stream earlier this week, or yeah, whatever, a little while ago. That was I speed did speed building the Lego ATST from Rogue One. That was a much smaller kit, 400 and some pieces. Just kind of figure out some basic ideas of how you want to approach that kind of a thing. I got done in a little over an hour and a half. Um, so maybe I'll do more of those. It's kind of fun to do those kind of things. It's kind of expensive too, but you know, you get. A $30 miniature gives me 15, you know, 12 episodes. A Lego kit for 70 bucks gives me one. So, you know, it's not price-wise not great, but you know, we'll, we'll get to see how they do on YouTube and how kind of popularity they build. That's really the main thing in the end, right? So anyway, once again, I'm rambling, talking about weird stuff, going off in crazy directions. <laughs> once again, I am Jason. Thank you for watching and have a good night.